from the internet, the International Jack Benny Fan Club presents the fourth annual Jack Benny Convention. Well, welcome back, folks. And now we are going to get ourselves a nice little treat. We're going to have a little tour through Jack's homes and Be- home in Beverly Hills, but we can't do this alone. So with me tonight is one of the representatives from the Beverly Hills Historical Society and somebody who had his own little familiar history with Jack, not just because he knows where he used to live. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Savinick. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, going to be fun to tell some old stories about the old neighborhood. Wonderful. Um, my parents moved to Beverly Hills in the mid 50s. So I and my mother's still in the house we've been living in for 60 years. Mm. Uh, Jack Benny bought his house in the 30s and lived up on Roxbury Drive. So I thought today I would tell you a little bit about Roxbury Drive which was the greatest movie star street in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know I have a diagram of it a little bit. There we go. There we go, yeah. Now, basically, uh, Jack lived at 1002 Roxbury, and his immediate uh, next door neighbor to the south was Lucia Ball and Desi Arnaz. And then across the street from them uh, was uh, Jimmy Stewart, who lived at 918, across from Jimmy were the Oscar Levants, uh, Hedy Lamar, Jack Haley, um, Tommy Mitchell, Scarlett O'Hara's dad, Eddie Cantor, they all lived on Roxbury. And up the street, Jose Ferrer and Rosemary Clooney lived there next to Ira and Lee Gershwin, in the house next to Agnes Moorhead, that had previously been Spencer Tracy's house. So you can see that that mailman had the best route in the universe. Uh, If we go to the next picture, you'll get to see Jack's house. It's still there. It's uh, not been torn down or ruined or otherwise remodeled out of all recognition, which many of the others have. And he bought it brand new for $250,000 in 1937. It has nearly 15,000 square feet and boasts eight bedrooms and seven bathrooms. This was a mansion. This was a palace. But as you'll see, it was all done in wonderful taste because he and Mary lived there with the, with their daughter, Joan. So if you go to the next picture, this is... It was the kind of house that had a pool with a giant octopus made out of tiles on the bottom. And of course, it was big enough for you to row a boat in. And Jack maintained through radio, television, the movies, that he was the cheapest man in the world. As you're going to find out, he actually wasn't. He was quite generous and he was quite lovely. We can go to the next one. This was Benny's living room. So as you can see, even though it was a giant house with a lovely gardens and a yard, it was very livable, sitting by the fireplace, listening to the radio, this kind of thing. So it was a very normal kind of thing. Um, Now, the tourists could be really pesky. And the family that lived next door at 1,000 between, before the Arnezes uh, lived there, actually felt compelled to put up a big sign with an arrow pointing next door that says, Jack Benny doesn't live here, he lives there. So uh, the tourists have always been coming out and around. Now, if we go to the next shot, that this is Jack's bedroom. And they had a little balcony upstairs and it overlooked, it had a library, overlooked the pool. So basically, It was a normal house, a normal sized house, but it was lavish by movie, radio, TV star standards. And our favorite thing when we were kids was to go trick or treating on Roxbury Drive. I don't know exactly why, whether we thought movie stars had bigger Hershey bars than everybody else, but that was the treat for us was to go trick or treating on Roxbury Drive. And that's where I learned about a very big secret about Jack Benny and the image and the reality. So I'm gonna have you guys play a little clip 
of what it was like to have Halloween in Beverly Hills. If you asked anybody what was the most fun day of the year in Beverly Hills, it would be Halloween. We used to trick or treat at the witch's house. That was, that was a must. Nobody's ever prepared for the witch's house. You just kind of have in your mind some sort of fantasy as to what it would be. I'm Michael LeBeau. We're here at the world famous witch's house, which is my house. It is landmark number eight, as known in the city of Beverly Hills. And I'm going to give you a private tour, so come along. Somehow it magically appeared on this site at Walden and Carmelita back in 1926, 1927. So what you see in here, most for the most part, is new and quite custom, but was designed to look as if it's 300 years old. From the broken tile to the hand-carved woods throughout, to the distressed cedar ceilings, each window in the home is different. Everything should evoke a feeling of an old home, yet it's basically new. What happens on Halloween is something that I expected but didn't really plan for initially. We truly get about 4,000 kids and adults mixed within about a four hour time frame. Now, trick or treating in Beverly Hills as a kid was one of the great experiences of my life. And the best street to trick or treat on was Roxbury Drive. Now, I remember it was 1957 and I was dressed as Santa Claus. And first we went to Jimmy Stewart's house then we went to Lucy's house, and then we came to Jack Benny's house. And I rang the doorbell, and the door opened, and there was Jack Benny. And I said, trick or treat? And Jack Benny said, what's your trick? Well, since I was dressed as Santa Claus, I sang Jingle Bells. And Jack Benny gave me a silver dollar. Now, a silver dollar in 1957 was a lot of money. And I remember walking out and thinking, the cheapest man in the world just gave me money. So it was an early lesson in the difference between the image and the reality. And I want you all to know, I still have the silver dollar. Talk about being a pack rat here. And it's dated uh, 1894. So my Jack Benny Halloween silver dollar he was not the cheapest man in the world, even though that's what he wanted everyone to think. <laughs> now, now, the most if you go to the next slide, the most famous house on the street, uh, go back one, was Lucy, back one more. Lucy, there it is, Lucille's Ball's house. She was on the corner and right next door to Jack Benny. Uh, and I had another friend who lived on the other side of them who I went to school with and I asked him, what was it like living next to Jack Benny? He said, I didn't see him much. I remember once he yelled at me and honked his horn when I was reading his newspaper sitting in his driveway when he came home from work. And he said, once my father punished me for playing my coronet in a duet while Jack was practicing. So he said, we didn't have a lot of exposure, but I, I learned to behave around Jack. Now, Jack didn't exactly behave. And one of the fabulous stories that Lucy Arnaz tells was um, <clears throat> one time Jack uh, uh, dressed up as a gypsy and with his violin uh, snuck into Lucille Ball's house through the back door while the family was eating a meal. He was completely in character playing the violin going around the table. Well, Lucy was in tears from laughter and her husband Gary Morton gave Benny a tip. <coughs> which, uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me, which Benny took, by the way. <coughs> but when Jack went back to his house, he realized he had was locked out. So they remembered all through the evening, Jack yelling, Mary, let me in, I locked myself out. And Lucy and the whole family just laughed through the whole thing. <coughs> um, Lucy had bought the house in the 50s and lived there really until her death in 1976. And then there have been some renovations to it, but basically the, these were the heavy hitters of Roxbury Drive. Now, to fill in my story a little bit, when we went to Jimmy Stewart's house for Halloween, he had a bowl of hard candies. When you're seven, hard candies are not very interesting. When we went to Lucy's, some years she'd have a bowl with some candy by the, well, some years she'd invite you in. The kids were having a party. She'd have a black tooth. She'd dress as a witch. 
a lot of fun. Other years, there'd just be a bowl in it said, don't you dare ring this bell. Uh, and then, of course, Jack, if you, you liked your trick, you got a silver dollar. Some of the stars, like Rosemary Clooney up the street, if she would run out of candy, she would give out autographed 8 by 10 photos. And, uh, but everybody was scrounging, but it's certainly Halloween on Roxbury Drive. So um, <clears throat> now we can go to those black and white pictures we saw. That's Lucy's house. Now, Lucy immortalized her house in an episode of I Love Lucy called The Tour. And she, uh, Richard Whitmark is in it. And she goes to Richard Whitmark's house and she climbs over the fence and she steals a grapefruit. And as you'll see, this was actually her house. He wouldn't let her shoot at his house, so she went and she shot in her own side yard. That's Lucy's house in I Love Lucy from Roxbury Drive. And if you go to the next one, then they go in the studio and you see a close up of the wall and the trees, you don't know, but the exterior, she pulls over the, the tour bus, she gets out and she walks into her own backyard. Uh, now, uh, for those of you who wonder what it was like to be a movie star in Beverly Hills on Roxbury Drive in those days, I have another little video to run for you, which I call Lucy versus the Tourists, because there used to be these big buses and people get out and wander around and get into everybody's business and mischief. And they spoke before the council to get these buses banned. And it really was a nuisance for the stars. So here's Lucy versus the tourists. Movie stars found a haven in Beverly Hills from almost the very beginning. They were America's royalty and built palaces in their own honor. Where movie stars go, tourists soon follow and we've had a steady stream ever since, all trying to see what's it really like on the inside. When Lucy Ricardo came to town, she and Ethel went on a bus tour of Beverly Hills. Only Lucy stopped the bus and got off. This is Lucy's actual real house on Lexington and Roxbury that she used in the show. If you ever wondered how Lucy really felt about the tourists from the inside looking out, Here's what she told the Beverly Hills City Council. I wanted to tell you that I lived next door to Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> and uh, when I first moved to Roxbury, um, they had big buses that went around. And I mean huge buses. And many, many, many people were let out of the bus and walked the street. And then the bus would pick them up within 15, 20 minutes, half hour. Literally, they would be standing in our lawn and have their lunch. On our, on our lawn, and I tolerated it for a few weeks, and I got to know that Jimmy was next door, and I said to him one day, I said, what do you do about this? I said, we can't go in or out of our house. There's always people sitting having lunch on the, on the front lawn. He said, very satisfactory. I found a way. He said, I go around back, and I wait till they get it all spread out, and then I turn on the sprinklers. <laughs> And it works. But I have a feeling that my wife and my kids and, and myself owe so much to Beverly Hills. We've been here as a family and grown up with this wonderful city for more than 40 years. It's, it's been a wonderful life for me and my family in Beverly Hills. So that's, and that's only a little bit of famous Roxbury Drive. There's more. Now, I'm thrilled that the people in this group may have heard this next name that I'm going to name. The name is George Gershwin, one of the great songwriters in the history of movies, Broadway, jazz, whatever it was. George Gershwin set the standard, Rhapsody in Blue, Bergen and Best, things like that. Well, George lived on Roxbury Drive at 1019. And I think I've got a picture of that house if we come up next. Well, that was Lucy in her backyard with her dogs, but there we go, the next one, there we go. So both George Gershwin and his brother Ira lived in this house at 1019. Uh, now in 1936, the Gershwin brothers wrote the music for Shall We Dance, 
let's call the whole thing off. They can't take that away from me in this house. As a matter of fact, the last song George wrote before his death of, of a brain tumor in 1937 was Our Love Is Here To Stay, and he wrote it in this house. Uh, it was too sad for Ira to live there without George, and the memory haunted him. So he decided he would move next door. And Rosemary Clooney and her husband, Jose Ferrer, took over the house. Um, <clears throat> now, I think, all right. Now, Rosemary Clooney was married to Jose Ferrer for most of the 1960s, uh, although she did divorce him twice that decade. But more interestingly, they were actually have the, the honor of having been stopped by the Beverly Hills police for violating Beverly Hills curfew by walking home from a party at Jack Benny's. There used to be a rule that if anyone was out walking at night <clears throat> or driving, the police would pull them over. Who are you, where are you going, where do you live, what? Well, they lived up the street, they're walking home from Jack Benny's, the police pulled them over. So they had that distinction. Now, for those of you with the next generation, <clears throat> Rosemary's son Miguel became an actor. And in the early 80s, her nephew George Clooney moved to town to try to get into acting. And he actually lived at the house with his aunt. And he made all the other kids jealous because he got all the parts in the pilots for TV shows that never sold until, of course, ER. And now look at George Clooney. But Rosemary was a lovely neighbor. She would say after one of the divorces, I'm a big fat Italian mama. I make a pot of spaghetti every day. We got a tennis court, we got a pool, I got a guest house if you can't get along with your parents, come on by and all the kids in the neighborhood, a very ritzy neighborhood, would come and Rosie would be the surrogate mother. Um, <clears throat> Rosemary lived in the house until her death in 2002 and again in one of the saddest situations, uh, the house was completely torn down, every stick, every stone, every tree, every rock, every brick in 2007. Um, now, if we go to the next one, I think we see Ira. This was next door at, 2000, at uh, 1021. And this is where Ira lived um, <clears throat> until his death in 1983. Originally, the house was owned by a woman who was a music lover, and she loved to stay up at night and hear George and Ira compose. When Ira came to her and said he was just so sad he could never walk in that house again, she sold him her house. And that was how that whole thing began <clears throat> at 1021. And again, I am very sad to report 1021 has been completely replaced with something modern and hideous, but that's my opinion. And next door to them <clears throat> at 1023 Roxbury, that had two very famous owners, one of which was Spencer Tracy, who lived there during most of the 1940s. And the other was Agnes Moorhead. So if you go one ahead, one slide ahead, we are going to see Agnes Moorhead and Spencer Tracy and the house at 1023. House at 1023 was also at one point Polly Bergen's house. Uh, when Agnes Moorhead lived there, the entire air, uh, interiors were done by uh, artist and designer Tony Duquette in her favorite color purple. And she did play a witch on television. So on Halloween, she would come out in full costume and scare the kids because Roxbury was the best street to trick or treat on. <clears throat> now, if we go to the next slide, uh, down the street at 906, Ginger Rogers lived there with her husband, Lou Ayers. And what was in the 30s, and what was so interesting is Ginger was not a drinker. So she had the bar turned into a, a soda fountain. So people would go there for milkshakes and malts, but uh, no booze. Uh, across from her was Hedy Lamar, lived on that street. Uh, Beauty Queen, who we now know is, was a mathematical genius. But by far the most famous res resident of, that, of the 900 block is this next picture, which is Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart had a, a house uh, next to the corner uh, on Roxbury. And at one point, he bought the house next door and had it torn down. 
so that he could use it as a garden because his wife loved to garden. And one day, one of their neighbors uh, was walking by and said, oh, Jimmy, you have the nicest garden in town. Can I hire your gardener? And Jimmy said, I'm really sorry you can't afford her. It's my wife. But he used to grow fruits and vegetables and take it to his neighbors. And he really made it a small town kind of a feel to be in Beverly Hills. We could always see him walking his golden retrievers, which he named after his twin daughters, Kelly and, and Judy. And on Christmas, he would read the night before Christmas at the Presbyterian Church, where his wife was the Sunday school teacher. So the house was originally built for King Vidor, uh, but it was demolished in 1998, a year after uh, Jimmy Stewart's death. Now, the next picture is what you saw. He, 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 he and, uh, and his wife loved to bicycle. And of course, if you rang your bell on your bike at them, they would ring their bell on their bike back at you. And that was always a thrill. The next picture is what you'd see if you actually got into the house. This was his living room, a lot of memorabilia from films and books and eclectic things. Uh, a, a big library was de rigueur for movie stars and you can see awards on the table. And the next still is I think the entry hall. So on trick or treat, you get that far in. <clears throat> and uh, he also had a picture that he had painted of Harvey the rabbit that was on the uh, entry hall wall. And then we'll go one more picture here. And oh, okay. <clears throat> Uh, no, we'll go, let's go back to uh, the Jimmy Stewart, and then I'll talk a little bit about the police. Uh, <clears throat> before Beverly Hills Cop, probably, oh gosh, 30 years before Beverly Hills Cop, Jack Benny used to have fun playing with the Beverly Hills police, playing jokes on them, using them in his shows. And here's a clip from Jack goes to the Beverly Hills Police Department. They were, he was a big supporter. They I guess this is the place, Beverly Hills Police Station. Through these portals pass the finest policemen in the world. Uniforms by Adrian. <laughs> oh, miss. Miss. Yes? Uh, I'd like to report a stolen car. Do you have an appointment? <laughs> No, no, I just want to report a stolen car. Have you been here before? No, no. <laughs> well, who recommended us? <laughs> Duncan Hines. <laughs> We still have tickets for the policeman's ball. The program? Well, we open with the overture from Tannhäuser, and then there will be a performance of the Swan Lake Ballet. <laughs> hey, that's quite a classy program. You know, it'd be wonderful for an encore if a policeman sang, Who Put the Tuxedo in Mrs. Murphy's Vichy Swan? <laughs> a cappella, and it was beautiful. <laughs> now, what about my stolen car? Oh, yes, excuse me. <laughs> Very well, you may speak with Sergeant Vandermeer now. Oh, thank you. Uh, Sergeant Vandermeer? Yes? I'd like to report uh, my car was stolen. Do you live in Beverly Hills? Yes, yes, I do. What kind of a Jaguar was it? <laughs> well, it, it wasn't exactly a Jaguar, you see, it was... Mercedes-Benz? No, no. It, uh... Come, come, mister. What kind of a car is it? Well, it's a... It's a Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Maxwell. Yeah. From uh, what country? <laughs> no, no, you see, it was made in this country. Of course, they don't make them anymore. You see, all of the factories still in existence, they make pencil sharpeners. <laughs> Well, you see, there were a lot of crank handles left over and was... <laughs> it was easy to convert. Oh, I, I see, I see. Uh, now, from where was the car stolen? Well, oh, oh, I don't... Boss! Oh, oh, hello, Rochester. Boss! Got here as soon as I could. Oh, uh, uh, this is uh, Rochester Van Jones. He, uh, he discovered the theft. He's my butler. Oh, the... Butler, eh? <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Van Jones. I'd like to talk to you. No. Recount in your own words just what happened during the entire day. Uh, well, don't, don't worry, Rochester. I'm right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> This morning, Mr. Benny called me from my room and told me he'd be gone all day. And he said while he's gone, he wanted me to clean the kitchen, scrub the floor, beat the rugs, wash the windows, polish the stove, wax the floors, and press his clothes. You were told to do all this at 8 o'clock, eh? And where were you at 8.15? Back in my room asleep. <laughs> asleep, Rochester. Quiet, please. Now then, uh, Rochester, when did you discover that Mr. Benny's Maxwell was stolen? I heard the motor as it went out the driveway. Oh, I see. You were sleeping, but you just happened to wake up when you heard the motor, eh? I didn't just happen to wake up. It threw me out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> See here. Now, wait a minute. You're suspecting the wrong man. Well, it's always the butler in the movies. I know, but this isn't the movies. Now, look, I'm a taxpayer, and I, I want Dad, to get my stolen car. Oh, I hated that Arthur creature. Excuse me, Sergeant. The prisoner in cell 29 has escaped. You mean that dangerous criminal we're holding for murder? That's the man. Well, he won't get very far. Get the hound. Yes, sir. The hound. The hounds? Hello. Hello, Chief. Alert all units. Today. We've always had so much fun with the Beverly Hills and the Beverly Hills police. But I do want to say that we all did it just in fun, you know. And they, I know the Beverly Hills police didn't mind because they're very, very dear friends of mine, particularly Chief Hennis. And uh, I know they took it in the spirit that it was men. You know what I mean? So next Sunday, be sure and watch Ann Southern. And I'll be back two weeks from today. Don't be too sure. <laughs> so that was Jack making fun of the Beverly Hills police and vice versa. Now, the next story that I'm going to tell, I'll tell you a little bit, another story, and then we, I think we're going to have some time at the end for a few questions. <clears throat> Every day for lunch, Jack Benny would go to Hillcrest Country Club, which was on Pico Boulevard right across from 20th Century Fox, almost Beverly Hills. <clears throat> and uh, he would get together with all of his buddies, and they would all sit at the same table for lunch every day. And when I talk about his buddies, we're talking about, obviously, George Burns was at the table. The Marx Brothers were there, Harpo and Groucho. 
the Ritz brothers were there, uh, uh, Harry, Al, and Jimmy, and they scared me as a kid because most of these comedians were serious in real life and crazy on screen. The Ritz brothers were pretty crazy off screen too. Uh, Danny Thomas, Danny Kay, Milton Berle, all basically sitting at the same table. Um, let's see, Georgie Jessel was at the table. At one point, Eddie Cantor had been at the table. Um, it was the, the, well, they called it the round table. It was the, 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 just the top of the comedians and they were all friends and they all had lunch every day. Now, the reason they were all members of the same club is because they were all members of the same tribe. In Los Angeles, in those days, there was a very heavy segregation system. So they were not allowed to join any golf courses because they didn't allow Jews. So in 1920, these guys and the other uh, really Jewish builders and makers and shakers, they got together and they bought their own country club and their own golf course. And Gentiles weren't allowed. But what it, uh, all of the studio moguls were members for, well, not all of them, um, Louis B. Mayer was a member. Uh, uh, Jack Warner was a member. Uh, Harry Cohen was a member. Even Adolf Zukor was a member. Uh, funny Zukor story, he had founded Paramount Pictures. Now, when I was little and would go to the club to visit my grandpa, George Burns always called me kid. And I thought that was great because everybody called me kid. I was four years old. I was a kid. Then years later, I'm there, and George runs into jo to Adolf Zukor, who's now 100. And he says to him, hey, kid, how you doing? I realized kid was not that big a deal. Uh, when I was there as a kid, and again, I was really three, four, five years old, and these are family stories that have been passed down and told about me. Uh, I, some of it I remember firsthand. Others have just been told so many times, I'm going to assume that I really did it. Uh, in those years, uh, Grandpa was allowed to sit at the round table. He was there every day for lunch. They were pals. For example, when I was three, he said one day, we're going to have lunch with Harpo. <clears throat> and all week I went around, Harpo, 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 I'm going to have lunch with Harpo. I had lunch with an old Jewish man. He was bald, he spoke, and he ate uh, pickled herring, which I thought was disgusting. So all the people would say, what was lunch like with, with Harpo? It was uh, nothing. I'd never seen a Marx Brothers movie. I was a kid. Um, but sometimes it, it got bigger than that. <clears throat> now, the guys at Hillcrest used to like to bet on anything. Uh, card games, especially, and sports, but also anything. So at a certain point when I was about three, Grandpa used to take me out to the parking lot. And he used to bet these guys that I could name any car in the parking lot. Well, they were 90% Cadillacs, so I could pronounce Cacalac and Dick Grandpa would win the bet. Then we bet I could guess what the next car that would drive on the parking lot would be. Again, I'd say Cacalac, I had a 95% chance of winning. <clears throat> then one day it was either a Rolls Royce or a Bentley or a Jaguar. I didn't know what the hell it was. I have no idea how much money was lost on that bet but we never played that game again. Uh, inside the guys, uh, some people thought it was just a card room with a golf course attached, you know, and a restaurant. Uh, the real re thing for them was always uh, the betting. Um, now, I rem there are a couple of good betting stories. One is, uh, again, segregation. Women were not allowed in the men's grill or on the men's side of the club. They didn't want kids there. They didn't want women there. This was their drinking club during prohibition and they weren't going to change the status. <clears throat> but apparently uh, Jack Benny and George Burns, they were on CBS, they were on NBC. And one year they were on different networks at the same time. And they got into a bet, which show did Gracie watch? Did she watch Jack's? Or did she watch George's? Well, because there was a bet involved, they grab Gracie out of the women's side of the club and they drag her into the men's grill. And it was like one of those shocking scenes out of, you know, pro, out of a, you know, Miss Pilgrim has come in. 
And but if she was settling a bet, she was allowed in there. And uh, George said to her, Gracie, what show did you watch last Tuesday night, Sunday night, whatever it was? And she said, well, I watched Jack's show because I already knew how ours turned out. And George lost that bet. <clears throat> now, there was one piece of this puzzle that never quite made sense to me, but I, you don't question family lore. And the question was, the round table was sacrosanct. You did not go and sit at the round table. If you, unless you were invited, you didn't go near it. This was a, what was a three or four year old doing at the round table with Mr. Burns and Mr. Benny, or Mr. Bums as I would call him. And then I had this memory that grandpa must have taught me, or we went to see the Jolson story. When I was three or four, I would do an imitation of Jolson. Now, Jolson was a member of Hillcrest. Jolson was actually the guy who started the round table, and they all thought he was the funniest of any of them. He had died a couple years before, and they used to say, call little Jolson, he'll come, he'll sing Mammy for us. So I became their mascot when I was that age. So that was the only reason they would let me at the table. <clears throat> and I did better than Groucho. They would not eat with Groucho. They would say hello, but they wouldn't eat with him because he had a habit of getting up to go to the bathroom before the bill arrived and never coming back. And you do that to your friends long enough, they won't even eat with you anymore. But every once in a while, I was allowed to go and listen to stories. <clears throat> uh, of course, it was deadly because every, they were all swinging cigars. Uh, you know, you got next to Burns and Burl and, and Benny and they're all, <clears throat> well, if you didn't die laughing, you died from choking, but, but that was that particular table. But the one joke that I think Jack had me play on George was, uh, he said, little Jolson, go over and ask George about why he comes in every day for a haircut. And I said, I've wondered that because he has no hair. Jack says, go ask him, go ask him. So I walk over, three, four, who knows what I was, put my hands on my hips and I say, Mr. Bums, I have a question. How come sometimes you come to the club and you're wearing a hat? And sometimes you come and you have no hat, but you have hair. And sometimes you come and you have no hat and you have no hair and you still get a haircut. What gives? Well, they all cracked up and George cracked up. So they were, I don't know that it was a bet, but little Jolson would go in and uh, be their little mascot. <clears throat> so, these were the kind of the stories of Hillcrest. Um, and it was just very natural. Now they were very old by the time, you know, I met them, but it was just very natural that they were normal people. They ate disgusting old Jewish food like pickled herring. Danny Thomas apparently really nice to me one day when I wet my pants and he said, anybody can go home and dry pants. Cannot tell you how many times I've wanted to go home and wet pants. So they, they were nice to me when I was little, and I've always remembered these stories, and especially about Mr. Benny and Mr. Bums. Uh, Jack used Hillcrest on his TV shows. Uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> he's, there's a, there was an a unwritten tradition at the club. If you shot a hole in one, you had to buy a drink for everybody in the club. Well, Jack in his show shoots a hole in one, doesn't want anybody to know he doesn't want to pay for the drinks. <laughs> so anyway, the real life and his make-believe life and he would say, I live in Beverly Hills, and Claudia Colbert lives down the block from me, or Ronald Coleman. They didn't, but he would always say that. And it was just as a kid growing up around these people and really enjoying and appreciating, maybe not so much George Jessel, but most of the others were just charming and, and lovely. Probably at that age, I was more excited that Sandy Koufax was a member of the club, or Jack Lemmon, <laughs> or some of these guys. Um, but that was me as a kid. And those are some of my memories of Jack Benny. And I just thought if we have a few minutes left, if anybody has any questions. Yes, I would, um, I would love to get some questions in there. Actually, we have one there uh, that actually you were talking about having grown up in that environment and having watched Jack on television or and having these clips on hand. Um, we've got a question from CL in the chat. He wants to know if any of the interiors depicted on Jack's show were any way modeled after his other his original home? 
Um, have you ever noticed anything in your research? Well, I pulled a couple of pictures. Um, I remember his, God, I don't actually remember. So you, you, you stumped me on that. You stumped the stars and uh, <laughs> you look at the shows again. And you have actually some pictures of uh, the living room, of his bedroom. There's mm -hmm. some more online. There's some on our website. We have a free app if anyone wants to walk Roxbury. It's called the Beverly Hills Experience. Completely free. We don't even track your email address. And you oh, go well, and you can go house to house. And there's what it looked like. And here's what it looks like. And here's the interior. And here's stories in some of the videos. So the Beverly Hills Historical Society actually for those of you who remember these people, who revere these people, we did set up a, a walking tour, one of where the movie stars used to live and one of Rodeo Drive. So mm. we invite you to go to our website, uh, beverlyhillshistoricalsociety.org, or the uh, app, which is called the Beverly Hills Experience, both free if you love this old stuff. And uh, it, it was a community where movie stars lived on every block. But it wasn't just that they were famous, they were great. These were the funniest, these were the most talented. And it, it really was an amazing environment to, to, to grow up in. Yeah, uh, I actually, we've got another one, if you've got time for one more question. Um, they, uh, we, I'm trying to pull it up, I've got everybody's messaging right at once. Um, the question was, do you know what Jack and George like to eat at the club? Do you have any idea what their their preferred meals of choice? I would are? say, uh, and I'm pulling this out of the air, a chopped liver sandwich on rye bread, some matzo mm. ball soup. Um, like I said, Harpo was this disgusting pickled herring thing. They were, you know, everybody was big on pickles. Uh, it was like a they, they treated it much like a deli, but with sort of old country food as well, uh, brisket. Mm and and things like that um but i would say a cup of soup and a sandwich almost any day and 115 cups of coffee nice oh yeah no i, I can imagine how much coffee was consumed around those tables <laughs> yeah and you mentioned the deli thing i mean like these are vaudevillians and what is a vaudevillian if not somebody used to kind of eating around the skirts of a fancy restaurant when they're getting ready to perform or whenever they have time in between the afternoon and evening shows. Um, and I, I was thinking of something in regards to the pictures you showed in the presentation. I don't know if it, I, I can't say for certain if they ever modeled the production design off of Jack's actual home, but it feels like the aesthetic and whatever was, uh, uh, in architecture at that point kind of resembles parts of Jack's den in some television episodes. It's more just like, this is what's familiar in terms of what are you gonna present as a house on television? I don't know if it's like specifically designed, but it, I get the same feeling looking at these photos that I do of Jack of the Jack's home set. It's not the exact to the detail, but I could I could definitely feel the, the energy of that era pressing the through books, the television. The couches, the windows, the, you know, the basic. Listen, that was what a home looked like then. Nowadays, mm -hmm. if, if you had something that was eight bedrooms, it would be, and it, you know, it would look like a giant Holiday Inn, you know. Yeah. But in those days, everything had character, and it really felt like a home. One of his mm -hmm. biggest regrets was selling it, and he'd drive by it and he'd say, "Why did we ever sell this?" But then he wouldn't pay what it would cost to get it back. You're right. Do yeah. I get to be the voice of God here? Yes. Oh, it does work. All right. Just like we planned it. <laughs> so uh, take a look at, and I don't remember if it's Irving's book or if it's Milt's book, but one of the biographies talks about the debates that they had behind the scenes when they were trying to figure that set out because Jack is so cheap. He's going to live in a ramshackle place, right? Yeah, well, wait a minute, you know, and then Jack had his idea that it was supposed to look exactly like his home in Beverly Hills, and they settled on something in between. So I'll say go back and, and look it up in the biography because it's there. There you go, CL. So we, we've we been able to to, to pre, potentially pre-solve a mystery. I like it. Um, and uh, Michael Rudolph, grand, uh, Jack's grandson, did just point out in the chat, Phil, or something that he did enjoy uh, in Las Vegas between shows was a liverwurst sandwich. So 
There you go. Some disgusting yeah. things like that. Absolutely. <laughs> you, got, you got to say it right. It's liver waste. <laughs> Wait, sorry, sorry. I apologize for my Gentile pronunciations. Um, they also had not spent much time at home over their years because if you were on the vaudeville circuit, you were never in a home per no, se. No, so they no. really enjoyed being planted and having their club and the buddies. And and uh, <clears throat> it, to me, it was just fascinating. I just wish I knew who more of these people were, you know, mm -hmm. back when I had contact with them. Uh, I could. I could say though, as a as Laura, the voice of God that you just heard, is a fan of a big fan of not just Jack but Al Jolson. So I'm sure she got a nice little kick out of uh, hearing that you charmed uh, her first her first love with the the abilities of her second love. <laughs> oh, definitely. Actually, George Gershwin is my second love. But um, so so let's let's hear your Jolson. Ooh, oh yeah, no, give I, it up. I will be I have a feeling I sang Mammy. I have a feeling I oh. got down on a knee. And I'm, I'm way too old and, and uh, <laughs> dignified to do that anymore. But Jolson had just died a couple years before. Mm -hmm. And he was all their favorite. And here was this kid who never had seen Jolson. I maybe had seen Larry Parks in the Jolson story. And here mm -hmm. I was doing Jolson and they just got a kick out of it. Or there would have been no way they would ever have invited me to mm -hmm. uh to listen to some of the joke and there wasn't really jokes they tell <clears throat> like i re the one i remember and i'll remember others as they go um <clears throat> jack george says to jack you know i feel terrible everything hurts i think i'll go to the doctor and jack says well you know that's funny nothing hurts me i feel great maybe i should go to the doctor because if there's something wrong with me he'll charge more <laughs> So they were kind of jokes. They kind of weren't. Yeah. But they were so also like a, very great to writers. Yeah. If, if I'd attribute Al that to. Had that 1943 for a smoker in Cleveland, they would give him credit. Yeah. <laughs> and you do have an Al Gordon show coming up, I saw. Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, yes, one of Jack's nice. writers, very funny man, lived in town. And, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the, it, it, they were, they, the writers made the shows, they respected them. They depended on them, and uh, that was such a nice thing. And yeah. these were just, yeah. they were great. It wasn't that, you know, they were famous for being famous. They were famous because they were really funny. And the mm -hmm. clip of the Beverly Hills cop that you saw, I ran it at the City Centennial uh, as mm -hmm. part of the film. And afterward, uh, Joan Benny came up to me, mm -hmm. and she thanked me for putting it in there, and she said, what I liked most about it was you didn't have some comedian say, you know, Jack Benny was really funny. You let dad be funny. And I'm sitting in the theater and people are laughing at dad because of what he was and what he did and not somebody's opinion. And he said, just thank you. She said, thank you for doing that. It meant so much to me to hear the laughter. I can't think of a better way to, to, to conclude the segment than hearing that story, Phil. Thank you so much for giving us this. Really quickly, one more time, let every, remind everybody where they can check out the Beverly Hills Historical Society and, and all the amazing work that you do with it. Well, we have a website, uh, Beverly Hills Historical Society org, with videos and stills and stories and maps and book, uh, books on the history of Beverly Hills, all kinds of videos. Even videos of our of the famous crime scenes, you know the out. We kind of picture them so that you can um, you you can go actually go there, walk by. A lot of them look exactly the same as they had. Then we have this mobile app, the Beverly Hills Experience, which runs on your phone. So if you want to start at the park, here's stop number one, stop number two and you can go on your own walking tour or driving tour of the homes of the former stars that lived everywhere. Nice. Uh, and also Rodeo, because that's still a legendary place. Um, and uh, again, we, we, made, uh, we also made uh, put history in the park. So if you mm -hmm. go to the Beverly Hills sign, for example, we have a video there of what it looked like in 1906 or what, uh, you know, the story of the parks. You know, Rodeo Drive had nothing to do with horses and rodeos. Rodeo de las Aguas was the meeting of the waters and the water came from Coldwater Canyon and Benedict Canyon. Suddenly we could build a little community because they had water. Mm -hmm. So we have great stories like that. Uh, it, 
Black History Month. The first landowner in Beverly Hills was a black Latina named Maria mm -hmm. Rita Valdez de Villa. She owned it all. She had the rancho from the Spanish. So they're just great stories of uh, how this little town became one of the most famous places in the world. And uh, I just can never forget when the streets were loaded with stardust in every restaurant you went to. It was You sat next. Well, I, 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 Jimmy's restaurant, the Bistro. The mm -hmm. tables were literally a quarter of an inch apart. But if you had Dean Martin on one side and Jaja Gabor on the other side, nobody was complaining. <laughs> you get the full experience, essentially. The it's full amazing. Experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Phil. And